How does the food you eat contribute to your health? Do supplements help prevent disease? For the past 25 years, the Linus Pauling Institute has served as a world-renowned research center at Oregon State University. Our mission is to promote optimal health through cutting-edge nutrition research and trusted public outreach. We use a synergistic strategy, connecting several scientific fields to bring a better understanding to dietary components and the role that they play in obtaining optimal health. We provide that information to the world, allowing people everywhere to live longer, better lives. Welcome to the Linus Pauling Institute's webinar series. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry if that uh, intro of music did not play correctly, but welcome to the uh, Linus Pauling Institute's webinar series. This is uh, Galvanizing Your Health, Why You Need Zinc, a uh, webinar by our own resident expert on the subject, Dr. Emily Ho, uh, also known as the director of the Linus Pauling Institute. I am Alexander Michaels. I'm your moderator for this webinar this afternoon or morning slash afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, and I'm also the communications officer for the Institute, and I will be uh, handling the Q&A session later today. Um, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here and bring you this final webinar of the uh, Linus Pauling Institute's 2022 uh, webinar series. Um, this, uh, we're, we're already working on our webinar series for next year, so you know, don't worry, we'll be back and we'll uh, probably start again in February with our uh, Linus Pauling Day webinar, which we will be announcing soon. Uh, but today I'd like to focus on the webinar on zinc and, uh, and this is just gonna go like many other webinars in our series. Uh, Dr. Ho will be coming on shortly and she will talk for about you know 25 minutes, 30 minutes in her presentation. And then we're going to switch to a Q&A uh, session, which will take up the remainder of the hour. We hope to finish around noon Pacific time. Uh, um, and, uh, and any questions that we don't get to um, during that time, we'll just uh, address in, in uh, future publications like our research newsletter. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to quickly, before I, you know, start bringing Dr. Ho on and, uh, and you know, because the Q&A will come up relatively soon. If any point during Dr. Ho's presentation, you do have a question, certainly put it into the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. I'll let you know that there are 850 people registered for today's webinar, and I think we received over 400 questions in advance. So um, that will um, will limit the number of questions that we can get to today. Okay, so Emily, would you like to turn your camera on? Um, as I already said, our speaker today is Dr. Emily Ho. Uh, Dr. Ho presented at the end of um, our, our webinar series last year and the year before. And so I don't think I need to go into a complete biography of her career uh, and you know has uh, uh, her history with the Institute, but, um, but I'll sum up a little bit. Uh, as you recall, Dr. Ho's research falls into two big buckets. One of them is the cruciferous vegetables uh, bucket, and the other one is the galvanized metal bucket, the <laughs> zinc bucket. Um, and so today we're going to focus on her zinc work. Um, her interest in zinc uh, started with um, uh, Dr. T Tammy Bray uh, at the Ohio State University, uh, if I remember that correctly. He was working with uh, in diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, is that right? Um, and she then went to uh, UC Berkeley as a postdoctoral trainee. Uh, at UC Berkeley, she trained under the legendary Dr. Bruce Ames at uh, Cori, the Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute. And it was in Dr. Ames' lab where she started to investigate zinc more carefully and it's uh, looking at its role in cancer. And I'm sure she looked at its role in DNA damage because that's what Dr. Ames loved to do. Um, and uh, she continued and expanded her work on cancer and immune function. And she joined the uh, Linus Pauling Institute in 2003. Um, I remember actually sitting in her um, 
uh, job talk uh, in 2003 uh, as a graduate student and being interested in the zinc angle especially. Um, almost uh, 20 years later, Dr. Ho is uh, one of the nation's leaders in zinc research. She's received an Outstanding Researcher in Vitamins and Minerals Award from the American Society of Nutrition and has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles in this area and continues to publish as I was just looking at some of her articles from earlier this year. And uh, in our latest newsletter, there will be an article uh, from the Ho Lab on zinc. Um, so thank you, Emily, for agreeing to talk to us today about zinc. And without further introduction, the floor is all yours. Oh, she can't unmute. <laughs> there we go. All right. Now we can hear you now. You hear me now? Yep. <laughs> And see me now as well. Yep, you're ready to go. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all uh, for being here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. I'm really excited to share this time with you and talk to you a little bit about some of the research that we're doing, um, not only at the Lyons Pauling Institute, but specifically in my lab as well. Let me see if I can get this to advance. So as, as you all know, you know, at the Institute, um, all of our researchers, including myself, really strive to help um, discover and enable individuals and communities to tip the balance towards optimal health. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of my research specifically, and as uh, Alex had mentioned, uh, kind of the joke in my lab with my students is whether or not they're team broccoli or team zinc. Uh, last year, I talked to you about some of the team broccoli work that we do, and today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, team zinc a bit more. So before we get kind of into things, uh, let's talk about you know, what is zinc. Uh, so zinc is uh, uh, an essential mineral or a metal. So it's an inorganic compound uh, that you'll find on the periodic table. Uh, if you remember this from your uh, chemistry high school classes, um, it's most similar to uh, nutrients uh, like copper uh, that's shown here. And hence there's some interactions with copper that I'll talk about. Um, you also notice it's in this middle section of the periodic chart. Um, this is a group of metals that are called uh, transition elements. A lot of these transition elements, uh, like iron, which is another um, essential nutrient, uh, transition in that they have, uh, they give up or gain uh, electrons. And zinc is a little bit unique in that it is a transition element in terms of uh, where it fits on the periodic chart, uh, but it doesn't transition. So uh, zinc state does not gain or accept electrons. It stays in a plus two state all the time, unlike copper and iron that transition between a um, either a plus one or plus two or a plus two plus three state. Um, and this unique chemistry of zinc um, really affords it some unique properties in terms of our human health. And in particular, because of its um, lack of transitioning, um, it really acts as a strong uh, stabilizing factor um, within our bodies and within our cells. Uh, and the stability uh, works in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, so one of the stabilizing things, so again, the title of this talk is Galvanizing Your Health, and this is exactly what zinc does. Um, it happens to, um, again, because of the stability, um, it's able to act as a pretty potent antioxidant. And the way that they it does this is because of that lack of, of redox activity. So it's able to um, stabilize uh, and help prevent things from getting oxidized. And that's exactly what this photo is showing in terms of galvanized steel. Basically, by layering zinc over um, iron, you prevent that iron from being oxidized. So in very simple terms, um, that's what zinc is also doing within our bodies, you know, helping uh, prevent our, our cellular macromolecules and our cells uh, from oxidizing and rusting and ultimately uh, losing, losing function. Uh, the, 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 the reach that zinc has in terms of function is, is multifactorial. Zinc is a part of over you know, 300 different enzymes um, within the body. Um, it's associated with an additional thousand um, different proteins and uh, especially transcription factors. Um, and zinc helps them uh, do their job. So 
Zinc is important in a, in a whole host of systems uh, within our, our bodies and within the cells. You know, so at the cellular level, you know, um, any cell that needs to divide or metabolize uh, needs zinc. Uh, for, uh, for cells to talk to each other, they need zinc. At the functional level, um, the systems that tend to need rapid growth um, or uh, rapid uh, cell metabolism um, tend to be the systems that rely more heavily on zinc. So things uh, like our reproductive systems, um, in our brain and our nervous system, uh, in, um, in our uh, Wound healing um, is another process that I think is very uh, important in. And I'm going to focus um, a little bit on, and um, if you were at my uh, webinar, uh, I guess two years ago, I focused quite a bit on the immune system. And I'm going to re talk about that. And in particular, another system that I think is very important is um, in, our, in terms of our cellular protection um, and our cellular repair mechanisms as well. So I'm going to go over that, but there's lots of reasons why we need zinc, um, but I'm going to focus uh, a lot on these, these bottom uh, two areas in particular for, for today. So first question is, you know, how much zinc do we need? So currently the recommended di dietary allowances are the RDA for zinc for an adult. Um, if you're a male, it's about uh, 11 milligrams. If you're female, it's a little bit less um, at eight milligrams to, uh, per day. Uh, where do we get our zinc? Um, we can get it from a lot of different foods. And we are gonna test out, um, Alex, I don't know if you can help share a, a poll. Um, just, uh, you hopefully can see this. Poll is up, people are answering. So which foods have the most zinc? Just curious if, uh, what we know. We got about 40% uh, of the people answering uh, so far. Still answers streaming in. <laughs> Just a quick test of your knowledge. All right, we'll give you the last few moments. Then I don't know, Alex, are you able to, to we're, stop? We're, yeah, uh, we're doing pretty good, actually. Uh, our, almost 75% of everybody has responded. Great. Um, okay, we're gonna call it in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, they got it, Emily. <laughs> All right, you guys are on it. So Here. foods that, oh, okay, great. So yes, of this list, crab, um, uh, it was, was the highest. A lot of seafoods do have um, high amounts of zinc. Um, the, the bottom line, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna can you close that? Yes. All right, so it's moving again. Let me see, my slides are moving. So good sources of zinc. So one kind of general rule when it comes to zinc um, is that it tends to follow protein. So there's very little free zinc in, um, in our bodies, um, and that includes in our food sources as well. Um, and where zinc often uh, resides uh, in cells are uh, as part of these enzymes or proteins. So protein-rich foods do tend to have uh, more, more zinc. Things like uh, lean meats, seafoods, um, but also vegetarian sources. So from vegetarian sources or plant-based sources, um, the, the, the foods that tend to be more protein-rich uh, tend to have, have more, more zinc. One caution that you have though, uh, in terms of if, for example, you're a vegetarian, uh, most of the plant-based sources, um, plant-based sources that have quite a bit of zinc also tend to have another compound called phytate. Um, this phytate, uh, long chemical name is inositol triphosphate. It's a very negatively charged compound. So it tends to bind uh, two plus things like zinc. Uh, so it's estimated that, so even though these uh, whole grain 
for example, nuts and legumes um, contain um, quite a bit of zinc, you will only absorb about 50, the, uh, a portion of it. So it's estimated uh, that you need to increase your zinc intake by uh, close to 50% um, to be able to absorb the same net amount because of that phytate. So if you're um, aiming, if you're a woman, for example, if you're aiming to get, a uh, sorry, eight milligrams of zinc uh, that you would actually need to consume 12 milligrams to get the net uh, uh, eight if you're a vegetarian. Um, in terms of highest uh, amount of zinc uh, pictured here are oysters. Um, oysters almost have uh, a log fold, a higher uh, amount of zinc than um, some other. So for example, beef, a serving of beef has about six milligrams of, of zinc, whereas a serving, a three ounce serving of oysters has close to 30 uh, milligrams of, of zinc. So you get quite a bit just um, from a, a single serving of oysters if you're worried about your zinc. So why are we talking about zinc? Uh, I feel like zinc sometimes flies under the radar in terms of a, of a nutrient that uh, you should be uh, thinking about, uh, but you should be thinking about it. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that zinc deficiency affects about one third of the population. Uh, developing countries are often the hardest hit, but even in developed countries like the US, uh, zinc deficiency is an issue. Uh, it's estimated about 12% of the population does not consume um, the EAR for zinc. Um, so that's the lower amount, um, not the RDA, not the 11 or, or 10 milligrams. So a significant portion of the population is not getting enough zinc. If you're over the age of 55, that number goes up to close to 40% um, that aren't consuming um, enough zinc. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about older adults in a moment. And one of the bane of our existence, uh, and one of the reasons why zinc often does kind of fly under the radar, is that we don't have a great test or, or marker that's either sensitive um, or reliable uh, for human zinc deficiency. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as well. Uh, but the bottom line is that the prevalence of zinc deficiencies is likely very much underreported because of this uh, lack of, of, of a biomarker. It it also causes a lot of confusion um, in terms of uh, supplementation trials. So um, in a lot of the supplementation trials, there are a lot of um, yes, no, maybe uh, answers. And a lot of that is because we don't have a good biomarker and we don't know if you take a zinc supplement, if you're actually repleting someone back to what they should be, um, or if they're already okay, and supplementing that has a very different response. And we uh, literally don't know necessarily where we're starting with uh, in a lot of these supplementation trials. So I'll talk about that later. So why do you need zinc? Um, let's talk a little bit about what happens when you become zinc deficient. Um, so I mentioned that zinc is a potent antioxidant and it is uh, for many different reasons. And the, this is work that I actually started in Dr. Uh, Ames' lab is uh, just ask the question, when you take away zinc, what happens? And the bottom line is when you take away zinc, lots of things um, start to go wrong. Uh, this is uh, an assay for oxidants. Um, and when we, uh, this is in a culture system, when we fed the cells a, a low zinc diet through their media, uh, we immediately saw that the zinc deficient cells had a lot more uh, reactive oxygen species. This also results in increased damage to the cell. So what this assay is, it's, it's um, nicknamed the comet assay because the comets uh, show uh, DNA damage. Basically you're assessing strand breaks. And when, you're, um, when you have lots of strand breaks, uh, the, the cells start to look like this, uh, this comet. Uh, and you can see here that uh, the cells that are zinc deficient not only have lots of oxygen stress, uh, but have lots of damage. Um, so our cells get damaged all the time, um, but we also have repair mechanisms that help coordinate the response to, to deal with oxygen stress um, and, and damage as well. And one of those proteins that does this is this protein called P53. Um, P53 is uh, a transcription factor. You can see here that uh, this is a Western blot and the bigger uh, blobs means that there's more of the protein and that's the normal response. In response to, to damage, uh, for example, P53 uh, 
upregulates um, and it coordinates a whole host of responses to help deal with that damage. And it does that through uh, transcription. So the, this is a, an example of the P53. The, the red dot um, is the zinc in it. Uh, and how P53 works, it needs to be able to bind to DNA and then tells the DNA to turn on um, and then turn on all the transcription and the proteins um, that are important in things like, like DNA repair. And what we found is despite seeing increased protein levels, so there's more of the protein, the P53 there, that it's not functioning properly. Um, and that uh, the, the P53, oh, it looks like my gel is not there, uh, isn't binding to the DNA. So it's, it's being produced in response to the DNA, but it's not functioning properly. Uh, so this uh, ends up being uh, quite the double whammy um, in terms of DNA damage, which is one of the important factors um, in terms of cancer progression. Um, increased DNA damage is, is going to increase your cancer risk. So when your cells don't get enough zinc, uh, again, what happens is you have increased oxidant stress, um, increases in, in DNA damage. That DNA damage uh, should signal a whole host of other systems to help um, repair um, and, and deal with that damage. Uh, but in the context of zinc deficiency, those systems are also impaired. So you're creating condition where not only are you creating more uh, damage, um, but also the ability to deal and repair with that damage. So the net effect is a decrease in DNA repair. And the net effect is way more damage. Um, again, this is going to potentially increase your risk for, for cancer uh, down the road. Um, so again, uh, we are susceptible to stresses all the time. So we want to ask the question, um, one, does this happen um, in vivo in terms of susceptibility to increased DNA damage? And what also happens if you add on additional um, oxidative stress? Um, so we did a study uh, in animals. Um, we have here at OSU a very strong kinesiology department as well. And uh, what we decided to do is look at the interaction between diet and exercise. So we took uh, animals and we fed them either a zinc adequate or a marginally uh, zinc deficient diet, which is the MZD as well. And then we also looked at the impact of, of exercise. So in this model, what we did was voluntary uh, wheel running in terms of our potential uh, or ox, uh, potential um, oxidant source, uh, oxidative stress source using exercise. Um, I do want to note though, um, so in this model, um, again, it's voluntary wheel running where we put a wheel um, into uh, the, the uh, the, the cages of, of the animals. Um, similar to people, uh, in terms of rodents, there are couch potato, couch potato rodents and also um, ultra marathon loving uh, animals as well. And these Spragdali rats happen to be running lover um, animals. Um, so I know, you know many of you at home may have your voluntary uh, treadmill um, in your homes that you may or may not use. Um, these animals love to run on their treadmills. So on average, uh, so these wheels have uh, wheel counts. Um, these guys are running close to 5K um, uh, each night. So you know, think little legs, 5K, um, they're running a lot. So this is a model of high intense, uh, pretty vigorous um, exercise. The amount of oxidant stress that they are exposed to is, is fairly high. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that uh, my lab has done historically a lot of work in prostate cancer as well. And zinc does have a unique uh, uh, interaction on, in terms of, of the prostate. Um, the prostate is actually one of the, uh, tissues that contains the highest uh, amount of, of zinc, um, at least of the soft tissues. Bone um, is a tissue that contains more zinc, but of all the soft tissues, uh, the prostate contains the highest amount. Um, the prostate also has uh, several different areas in it. And the area um, called the peripheral zone um, is the zinc accumulating region of the prostate um, and not all the other regions of the prostate uh, um, accumulate zinc. What's interesting is um, that the zinc accumulating section of the prostate is also typically where prostate cancer happens um, as, as well. And the last fact is we also know that as 
um, cancer develops, there seems to be a dose dependent decrease in zinc levels in that region of the prostate. So the nastier the tumor, uh, the lower the, the zinc level is. So this is just an example of, of the prostate. So again, there are several uh, zones um, and this peripheral zone is again, the zone that tends to um, develop uh, prostate cancer. And on the chart here, you can see um, you know, our blood plasma has about 15 nanomoles per gram. Uh, other soft tissues are about 200. And you can see that peripheral zone has you know, over 10 times uh, the concentration of, of zinc um, in that, again, this is the zone that prostate cancer tends to develop. Um, and you can see it drops pretty significantly as, the, um, as, the, the, as cancer develops. So getting back to our study, uh, what we found kind of really interestingly is uh, this was not a prostate ca cancer study at all. We simply were looking at the interaction between exercise um, and, and zinc status. And one of the first things that we noticed is that the prostate was highly sensitive to uh, loss of, of zinc uh, when you are not uh, when you're not consuming enough zinc. So these are zinc levels. So here's the plasma. Um, on the left um, are the zinc adequate. On the right are the animals that receive the low zinc diet, and you can see in their plasma levels start to decrease. But what was interesting of all the tissues, um, again, just feeding a low zinc diet, um, the prostate saw a significant loss, um, in particular uh, in this dorsal lateral lobe. Um, so the in, in rats, the names of the zones are a little bit different, but that this dorsal lateral lobe is equivalent to that peripheral zone. So again, that area that it tends to accumulate zinc, um, and it also seems to lose zinc very specifically when you're fed, uh, when you're not eating enough. Um, and here is another zone, the zinc, uh, and you can see that the, the um, ventral lobe does not lose its zinc. Um, you can also see there's quite a bit more zinc um, in, the, um, in the, that peripheral zone as well. So what is happening functionally? So we assessed um, oxidative damage in these animals as well. Um, so here again is looking at that dorsal lateral lobe um, that uh, again is the prostate cancer uh, susceptible lobe. Um, and the bottom line is, so when I look at zinc adequate to zinc deficient, at least in the animals that are not exercising, there actually was not um, much change in DNA damage. Similarly, if I compare a zinc adequate um, animal uh, sedentary versus exercise, there isn't much change. However, if I combine the two, we now start to see uh, a, a pretty significant uh, increase in that in DNA damage, saying that uh, you know normally in just exercise you're able to uh, not have damage. Even with the stress of zinc deficiency by itself, um, you're able to potentially repair um, and deal with that damage. However, if you have both simultaneously, you override the system or you overwhelm the system, um, and now you're increasing DNA damage possibly by um, limiting those DNA repair me mechanisms. What's interesting, if I look at the ventral lobe, which again is the lobe that isn't losing the zinc in response to the low uh, diet, but also is not the lobe that is susceptible to cancer, that we see no changes across the board. So uh, deficiency or exercise alone and did not and change DNA damage, but however, a combination did as well, which ultimately says um, maintaining adequate zinc status, especially if you're exposed or stressed um, due to uh, exercise or potentially any um, other stress that causes um, oxidation, um, that you really need to make sure that you are maintaining adequate zinc status. Um, and this could have an impact on uh, cancer risk. Um, and I'll talk next about the other system uh, that also has high susceptibility to damage um, are our immune cells. Uh, so what populations are gonna be most susceptible to zinc deficiency? So I mentioned before, um, in the US and in many other countries, if you're over the age of 55, um, you tend to consume less zinc. So 40% of both men and women um, do not get enough zinc, older adults do not get enough zinc in their diets. Um, another unique thing that we see is uh, as you age, your ability to utilize zinc is not as efficient as, uh, as a young person. Um, so you, 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 you tend to have lower zinc status, even if you are consuming uh, potentially enough 
zinc um, due to changes potentially in absorption and or uh, distribution. So um, you have very much, a, a, again, a, a double whammy uh, in terms of susceptibility to zinc deficiency um, as, as you age. And what are the consequences? So we know that aging is associated with a compromised immune system. Um, and it's possible um, that that compromised immune system could be related to compromised uh, zinc status as well. If I superimpose um, impact of zinc deficiency on the immune system with age-related dysfunction with the immune system, they're very, very, very similar um, in that you see things like increased susceptibility to infectious disease, um, reduced vaccine efficacy. So you have a blunting of some arms of the immune system, um, but we also have overactivity with both aging and zinc deficiency um, in terms of our um, inflammatory state. And you have increased chronic inflammation as well, um, both with zinc deficiency um, and, and age. Uh, we know that the immune system is, is highly complex uh, in terms of multiple parts. Uh, there's our barrier function, um, our innate immunity, uh, which is uh, things like our neutrophils and our macrophages that help invade, um, uh, engulf and destroy. And then we also have our acquired system, which are things like our T cells and our B cells that help produce um, uh, uh, systems to, to target um, foreign uh, viruses and, and bacteria. And the bottom line is zinc is really needed for, for all of these functions. Uh, so we've done some studies in um, older animals as well. Um, so this is a study where we took young, which are about two month old animals, which are uh, considered to be a young adult versus almost two year old mice, uh, which is more like a over 65 year old. Um, and we found um, that the first thing is, despite giving uh, these animals what we think is a zinc adequate diet. So this is the AIN uh, 93M diet uh, that, these animals still kind of look like they're zinc deficient. Um, so their plasma zinc levels are falling um, and they look like they're just deficient even though we think we're giving them enough. Um, we also see uh, a marked increase in inflammation. Um, so this is a marker called interleukin-6. Um, that's a pro-inflammatory marker uh, and uh, the older animals have significantly higher amounts of, of inflammation. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, if we supplement uh, zinc, um, that we're able to uh, you know, restore zinc levels in the older animals close to that of the young animals. But importantly, restoring the zinc levels um, also mitigated the inflammation. Uh, so we saw uh, a really big uh, change um, in terms of um, inflammatory status, a result of correcting uh, the zinc levels. So the correcting the zinc levels also uh, corrected the immune dysfunction and helped prevent um, inflammation. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that getting enough zinc is important. And as I talked about before, um, you would think that this would be a standard thing that uh, our physicians would look for um, in terms of, uh, of your status, since it's such a critical part of um, your immune function, um, cancer susceptibility, and many other systems. Unfortunately, we do not have a great biomarker for zinc deficiency. Uh, currently, the test that your doctor will order if they are interested in zinc is a fasting plasma zinc level. Um, and I'm going to show you some data uh, from, uh, from my lab uh, where we did a human study uh, where we looked at modulating zinc status, in, in this case, adult men. Uh, so the men uh, came in. Uh, there was a kind of an acclimation period uh, for almost two weeks where we put them on a zinc adequate diet containing that 11 milligrams. And then we put them on a low zinc diet of uh, about four milligrams of, of zinc uh, per day for about uh, six weeks. And then after that time, we also uh, did a repletion where they we fed them back um, a little bit of a zinc supplement um, and also uh, gave them an adequate uh, amount of, of zinc and looked at the effects. And the first thing I wanna show you is this is the plasma zinc levels. Um, and what do you notice? They're pretty well all the same. So these are people for over a month um, are eating a low zinc diet. So we know they are 
at risk for zinc deficiency. Yet the biomarker um, that is currently used in the clinic doesn't change. So clearly, um, this is not a, a, a sensitive uh, marker for, for zinc deficiency and likely misses, if you're using this as a test, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna miss a lot of potential cases of, of potential zinc deficiency. And the reason why that missing is a problem is uh, when we look at functional changes, um, so even though the, the test um, that's used in the clinic says you're not zinc deficient, um, you are, and there are some things that are starting to go wrong. Um, so in this case, we use that same comet assay, and you can see starting in the green, this is the beginning of the, the depletion period, there is a, a steady increase in DNA damage uh, throughout the study period. Uh, good news, uh, once we replete um, the individuals, uh, we are able to reverse the, so the, the problem is, is, is absolutely reversible and can be easily rectified just by um, giving back enough zinc. Um, the other thing that I want to point out, though, is this is the other thing that we saw at this baseline period, um, a, a significant drop um, in, in DNA damage. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is we attempted to recruit people um, that were not zinc deficient. Um, unfortunately, what did we probably use, what did we use as our screener is plasma zinc levels. So what we think is happening in this baseline period of study is that we likely had a lot of individuals that that were at least marginally zinc deficient. Um, and basically during that two week acclimation period, we were able to replete them um, and help fix some of their DNA damage. So um, there's a lot of new uh, research in terms of trying to, uh, including in my lab, trying to identify you know, better biomarkers. Um, but the bottom line is uh, getting enough zinc um, is gonna be highly important. Um, Again, because there isn't a great test, it's really up to, to you to, to make sure that you're consuming um, enough zinc. Um, so again, currently our recommendations, uh, the RDA, if you're a man, um, 11 milligrams. If you're a woman, um, eight milligrams. Um, this is important for your immune system, but many other functions within in, in your body. Um, you may, especially if you're an old adult, older adult want to consider taking a zinc supplement, um, but there is a bit of a caution and you can get too much of a good thing. Uh, so zinc by itself is actually fairly non-toxic. However, um, if you consume too much zinc, it can interfere with other minerals, um, especially uh, that copper that I told you is uh, similar um, in terms of properties. And if you take too much zinc, you will uh, limit your body's ability to absorb copper. And copper deficiency also has impacts on your immune system, oxidant stress, um, and that type of thing as well. So the current upper limit for zinc per day is, is 40 milligrams per day. Um, so you may want to consider, uh, if you do consider a zinc supplement, uh, to make sure that you're not consuming over 40 milligrams per day um, to limit the, the interactions, uh, especially with copper um, and, and with iron. So the bottom line is uh, you need to make sure that you're getting adequate zinc um, daily. That's both through foods um, and with supplements. Um, you can, again, take extra zinc as a supplement, but be uh, careful um, in terms of, uh, of your levels that you, again, can get too much of a good thing and have problems uh, with excess zinc as well. Uh, and uh, to, to be mindful of that as, as well. The bottom line is, you know, what we do at the Institute is to help you live better longer. And zinc is certainly one of the things that, that you should consider um, and, and take note of in terms of helping uh, your overall health and, and healthy aging. Before I open up for questions, um, I do want to point out at the Institute, uh, we have this fabulous resort, the Micronutrient Information Center. Uh, we have um, several uh, articles on zinc itself. Uh, we also talk about zinc and some other uh, immune fighting uh, or boosting or uh, achieving uh, nutrients um, in these two articles here. Um, and then we also have a more recent um, article in terms of other nutritional strategies to help your immune system if you're interested in that. Um, again, uh, last time when I talked about zinc, I talked a little bit more in depth in terms of uh, immunity as well. So if you wanna check out that webinar, it's also on the website. Um, so again, just encourage you to, uh, to uh, in this time, I've only, 
able to kind of really uh, do a brief overview if you want to dig in. Um, check out the Micronutrient Information Center. Um, we also have newsletters. There will be a zinc article um, in the next newsletter as well. Um, and there's lots of other resources on our website for, for you to check out. So with that, we'll open up for Q&A. Hey, um, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Emily, for, for giving that presentation. I uh, Every time I hear you talk about zinc, I immediately want to run out and get some oysters somewhere. Uh, I know some people are probably thinking, eh, but uh, I, I love oysters. So uh, that's one of my favorite ways to get zinc. Um, so in a moment, we're going to move on to the Q&A section. I see that people are, are typing questions in and have been doing so since the beginning of the talk. Um, and as I'm speaking, you know, go ahead and add more questions to that Q&A section. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I wanted to mention, though, at this point that uh, the Linus Pauling Institute uh, complements some of these webinars with additional information that we put into our newsletter, uh, our, the research newsletter that's our, our recent edition of the new newsletter is going to be coming out sometime this month. It's it's kind of on its way to printing at the moment. So you'll be getting it in your inboxes fairly uh, fairly soon in the next couple of weeks. But we, we, we usually take the extra questions that you didn't get answered in these webinars and, and get Emily's answers and put them into our newsletter. And sometimes we create extra materials related to the uh, webinars. So look there for follow-ups, uh, things that you didn't get answered today. Um, and and in our, our most recent um, newsletter, the one that's coming out soon, uh, we actually have some Q&A from our previous webinar on vitamin E with Dr. Maret Traver. So you can check that out uh, when it comes out in, uh, in your inbox or mailbox, depending on what you signed up for. If you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you can do so on our website, uh, and we'll be sending out links for that uh, as a follow-up to this webinar. Um, if you appreciate the webinars, newsletters, or other information that we provide to the Institute, uh, we ask that you please consider a donation to our research and outreach programs. The, these programs are primarily funded through um, donations or, or generous giving from our followers. Uh, so without your support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these programs that we do on a regular basis and we will continue to do uh, in the, the coming year. Um, so, you know, lend us your support in any way that you can. Um, and I'm going to put that link to giving uh, just so everybody has it into the chat right now. But uh, obviously, I will send it to you other ways as well, as well as some of the links that Emily uh, put in some of her slides, including uh, directions to get to the Micronutrient Information Center, where we have a lot of our information on zinc and the immune system. Okay, switching gears, it's time uh, for the Q&A. Um, so some quick ground rules. The, the Linus Pauling Institute is not a medical institution, so we don't answer questions on per personal medical health conditions. Uh, so we try to get very general uh, with, um, in terms of the, the medical conditions, general information on health and nutrition, uh, but we will obviously dig into some of the specifics around zinc. Um, and if I, like I said a couple times already, if, um, if we don't get to your question today, we'll try to get to in future installments of our newsletter. So um, with that, I think the first question I want to ask you, Emily, is about, um, I mean, we, you talked about food sources of zinc. Um, is there any consideration about like different food sources and whether or not it's, it's going to be an adequate source. I mean, uh, meat tends to be a decent source, but uh, what about, let's, let's start with uh, vegetarian diets. You know, uh, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, where is the, uh, the best place for you to get your zinc? Yeah, that's a, a great question. As I mentioned, um, the vegetarian sources of zinc, like things like lentils, seeds, um, they have, two to three milligrams of zinc per, per serving. So that's usually a, a tablespoon, uh, a couple tablespoons of, of those. But the issue is those foods also have um, what are called anti-nutrients in, in them, things like phytates. Um, there's another compound, um, uh, oxalates that 
that bind up the zinc. Um, so what happens there is when you consume those foods, um, a complex forms in, in your stomach and in your, your GI tract um, that limits, uh, that makes it bigger. Uh, so now you can't uh, absorb the zinc as, as well. Um, and it's not a, a, a total block, um, but I think I mentioned um, it's estimated that you would need to increase your zinc uh, total zinc intake by about 50% mm. to account for that block. And that's not something that you see, for example, on a food label uh, in terms of your, your daily value. So if you're exclusively vegetarian, um, that you might want to, that one, you need to consume more zinc, uh, but two, that again, for insurance, you might want to consider taking a multivitamin, multimineral um, that has zinc. The other thing that I want to point out, um, if you're looking at a multivitamin, multimineral, um, zinc is one that is often left off the table on in terms of some uh, multivitamin, multivitamin. It does have a adverse taste uh, sometimes to some people. So um, definitely look at your your supplement label um, in terms of zinc content. Just because it ha it says it's a multimineral doesn't necessarily meet meet uh, that doesn't necessarily have zinc or it could be a very low amount of zinc. I definitely want to ask you some questions about the, the supplements, and there's uh, a few that are uh, are in uh, the chat and in our, our list right now, but staying with food. So um, the, the phytates or, or the other anti-nutrients like oxalate, it, can you think of that as more like a, a almost like a imperfect coating around the zinc that, that prevents some of it from getting absorbed and just passing through or... Um, there's, there's, there's ways to handle those though, in terms of food prep, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, um, if the phytate or oxalate binds with the zinc, um, it's, that's a covalent bond. So you can't okay. break it. Um, but there are strategies to help minimize the phytate. Um, so there are enzymes, um, that uh, phytase enzymes, but cooking, um, some cooking preparations uh, will help uh, limit, uh, so fermentation, uh, for oh, example, yeah. something that'll help break down the phytate. So the phytate content basically will, the phytate won't bind to the zinc um, as, as efficiently. Uh, but none of, even if you cook it, um, you'll decrease it, but you won't totally get rid of it. Okay. So, Eliminate some, you know, yes. uh, limit yes. limit the problem, you know, um, but still there's probably an increased need for additional sources of zinc uh, based yeah, on just all numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Getting the getting the right numbers. <laughs> um, um, so um, I guess I'll, I'll transition there into the zinc biomarkers, actually. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked about, like, how do I know if I'm getting enough zinc? Um, because obviously the combination of the food sources you eat, there's some uncertainty of how much you're getting there. You've got, as you mentioned, the um, variation absorption. And so obviously people would turn to blood for, for, <laughs> for measuring this, but that, uh, as you said, isn't the best place to go. Is there any other indicators? I mean, um, we had a question in the, in the chat that about like white streaks on nails. Is that an indicator of zinc uh, deficiency or are there other ways that yes, you, yeah. you can tell? So um, for a lot of nutrients, the biomarker that you're going to try to use is measuring the, the, the nutrient in different things. Yeah. Um, people have looked at plasma, red blood cells. Um, you've looked, people have tried to look at hair and nail zinc as well. Um, all of them seem to be not terribly sensitive. Um, hair and, uh, and nail zinc, so the, if you become dis, uh, zinc deficient, the, your collagen synthesis and uh, your just cell synthesis is, is depleted. So you get brittle nails, you can get those, like uh, it was mentioned, those white streaks. You have to, you're fairly deficient though, um, once those symptoms show. Um, so it's not a, that, that is not an early, uh, ultimately we want a biomarker to find things early uh, before problems really start to happen. And if you see those defects in your nails um, or changes in your hair and, and nails, because those are not rapidly turning over uh, systems, that largely means that you've probably been deficient or look for, for, for a while. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of work on the research side in terms of identifying better blood 
based uh, biomarkers. Um, so uh, metallothionine, which is a, a, a small molecular protein that's sensitive to zinc has been postulated to be used. Um, there's a, a, a paper uh, by one of my collaborators, Janet King, that has been looking at uh, metabolites, um, especially fatty acid metabolites that may be a, a better bi biomarker. The issue with those biomarkers is one, there isn't standardization yet. So there isn't a, a number um, you can see compared to someone who isn't getting, who is getting zinc, that the levels are different, but it's not like we have a value, a target value. Right, right. Yeah. And that's kind of where, where the research needs to go. In terms of something that people can do now, though, um, is you know, getting a dietary assessment um, in terms of looking at uh, their food intake, um, in terms of uh, what they're normally eating and getting an, uh, an estimate of how much that is. And then uh, adding on to that su um, supplements, perhaps, is, is is one way. It's kind of um, crude, but yeah. The and I was going to mention when you you talked about hair and nails. Obviously, that's a very non-specific. Uh, deficiency symptoms. So you know you can get white streaks in your nails for a variety of reasons, yeah. and you know strange things happening with your hair for <laughs> multiple vitamin and new, mineral deficiencies. Yeah. So obviously, don't use that as a, a great indicator. Um, uh, when, when it comes to uh, getting the RDA, though, I mean, um, is is there some indication that maybe more than the RDA would be? I mean, especially you know you, we've mentioned a couple times already about the anti-nutrients or the, the phytate, you know, it could argue that, and, and with aging, um, as you get older, it could argue that maybe you want to get a little bit higher than the RDA, but we, do we have any idea of how much more, um, or is it just kind of a little bit of a hand-waving? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's definitely a little bit of hand waving. I'm certainly an advocate in terms of trying to increase the, the RDAs, especially for, for older adults. Yeah. Certainly, uh, the RDA for zinc um, is the same if you're 18 or if you're 90. Um, and given the, the research that, uh, that that's out there, it suggests that as you age, especially getting in the last decades of your life, uh, that you might need more because you're not going to be able to utilize as, as much. Um, I think certainly, um, uh, I mean, right now there's calcium and vitamin D are really the only nutrients that have age specific RDAs. Um, and I think there's other ones that, uh, including zinc, that need to be considered. Um, I still do think, though, that, that you have to be mindful, even if you want to increase. Um, on, I mean, I, uh, I do tell my mom to take a 20 to 25 uh, uh, level of, of zinc, um, but uh, you can get you know, 50, 100 milligram zinc supplements out, out there as well. And I would still advocate for staying below uh, the 40 to 50 milligrams uh, per day for the, the other nutrient interactions. Okay, that's that's a great segue into supplements because there's, there's definitely a lot of questions about supplements and, and zinc supplements. Um, Let's start with, uh, well, let's talk about like when's the best time to take your zinc supplement because I know that, or, or what you should do if you have problems taking zinc. For example, I, I get stomach aches whenever I take a zinc supplement. And, uh, and I've noticed that um, there, there are certain times I get stomach aches, certain times I don't, certain supplements. Uh, I don't know if it's the forms, but we can talk about forms in just a moment. But, you know, is there any tips in terms of like if you get some reaction to taking zinc or is there a best time to take your zinc? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of the mineral supplements do have um, stomach GI issues as, as a potential side effect. Um, zinc uh, is one of those supplements that you do want to make sure you take with food, um, that you take it with food um, and that will sometimes help. Um, I often recommend people to try to take their zinc supplement later in the day. So even if you take it with food first thing in the morning, you're still kind of have an empty stomach. Um, so if you do it, you know, more at your lunch time or uh, or at your dinner time, um, you'll likely have something more postprandial in, in, in your stomach. You know, if it's that first meal of the day, it just takes a while for everything to get down there, um, even though you're you are taking it with food. So, um, you know, taking it with food, then then that brings up the question and then not just the food itself, but um, 
other supplements. Uh, so is there any issues with mixing zinc with other mineral supplements? I think a lot of people ask about zinc and calcium, zinc and magnesium. Calmag zinc is obviously a, a supplement that you see on the marketplace. Um, you know, do you have to worry about mixing it with other minerals? Is there an issue there? So um, in terms of their chemistry, there is potential competition. Um, the way that zinc you know, gets into our um, our, our bodies uh, are multiple transporters. Uh, so there are zinc specific transporters and then there's these divalent metal transporters um, and also amino acid transporters that zinc will get in. So uh, if you are taking a lot of calcium or magnesium or other metals, there's a chance that the um, you might have competition uh, for that divalent metal transporter to get, uh, so it might limit it, but to be honest, it's pretty minimal in terms of those, the, those interactions because there are alternative transporters that are zinc specific that magnesium or calcium will not look at. Um, that, uh, like I said, based on the chemistry, there's gonna be some competition, but in terms of reality, uh, the, if you're taking a calcium supplement, um, you limit zinc to a small degree, um, but if it's inconvenient or if your supplement is just one that's formulated with calcium and zinc in it, you don't need to necessarily worry about it. I see. Okay. So, um, you know, one thing that I did find worked good for me was a Calmag zinc supplement. I didn't get the stomach problems that I did with a, uh, with a zinc alone supplement. Um, the, um, so, so it's basically, you know, maybe less than perfect, but no, not clinically relevant differences uh, when it comes yes, to yeah. mixing. Especially when you're taking it at a supplemental level. Gotcha. Um, uh, so let's talk about the, the forms of zinc supplementation. Uh, there's obviously different products out there on the market. Do you have any idea of which ones are better, which ones are maybe, I think bioavailability is, tends to be the goal, but minimizing side effects is another one. Um, so do you, uh, do you have a, not, right, not yeah. necessarily a recommendation, but just some guidelines? So in general, at least in people, the evidence that the different forms of zinc, even food-based um, differences in bioavailability um, is questionable, um, I, I guess. But with that said, so um, getting back to the food, so most of the zinc that's in food is complexed. There's very little free zinc as free zinc you know, anywhere in, in our biology. Um, so in our food and our supplements, zinc is always stuck to some, something. Um, how it's stuck to something may change um, both uh, side effects and bioavailability. Uh, Again, it's a little bit up for debate how big of a difference it is. I mean, the studies that I've seen, it may be a 5% change. Um, and so the ones, um, so they're, so I guess stepping back um, to supplemental forms, the most common forms you're gonna see zinc complex to are salts. Um, yeah. So zinc sulfate, zinc acetates or other organic acids, zinc gluconate, um, and then there are the, um, chelated forms um, that tend to be stuck to things like amino acids, uh, small proteins, um, uh, and, and that type of thing. Um, in animal studies, uh, so again, one way that zinc can get in is through piggybacking on amino acid transporters as well. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, there is in animals, at least, some evidence that the amino acid chelates um, may uh, have increased bioavailability, but just because they, they are able to piggyback on another trans transport mechanism. Uh, evidence in people is a, a little bit more questionable um, in terms of, um, and I think also um, some of the si stomach side effects as well, because it's, it's basically kind of piggybacking on regular protein and mm. metabolism, um, maybe less as well. Um, but the bottom line is, um, if you are gonna take a zinc supplement uh, form, rather than uh, amount matters more than, than form. Gotcha. Okay. Um, obviously, if you have any reaction to any particular form, you could try a different form to see if that deals with you better, but maybe taking it with food is the better, uh, the better approach, as you said. Um, the copper then, copper then comes up very commonly when we're talking about zinc supplementation. And so you did mention that, you know, taking uh, high amounts of zinc does 
help uh, or sorry, does limit copper? Uh, get, uh, can you elaborate that on a little bit more? I mean, yeah, should yeah. we be taking copper with with zinc if we're supplementing at least or at what level do you start worrying about copper? Yeah, and let me um, step back in terms of telling you kind of how that interaction happens. Um, and it is at high levels, so at normal levels, or RDA, for example, um, you won't have that same comp competition. When you start to get above that 40 to 50 milligrams of, of zinc, what happens is high amounts of zinc um, will induce or, or cause a, a protein called metallothionine to be upregulated in your GI tract. Um, the metallothionine, uh, similar to the phytates, binds up copper and, and zinc. Um, so when you have lots of zinc, you'll make more of the protein, but you've got lots of zinc around. So it'll only bind up some. But if you don't have, uh, but metallothionine will also bind copper. So if you have a little bit of copper around, it'll also suck up the copper. And similar to the phytates, it forms a new complex um, that uh, will limit our, the ability of the copper to get absorbed. So mm. if you're taking like a multivitamin that has not terribly high levels of, of zinc, you're not going to have this induction of this new protein that sucks up the copper. It's only when you get up to these higher levels of, of zinc um, that you'll cause this protein to be made in the gut and it'll start to suck up the copper um, and make it uh, less bioavailable. Um, so there is some strategies, uh, some supplements, some high dose zinc su supplements um, do put copper in the formulation as well to kind of override this. Again, it's all a numbers game. If you increase the protein, it'll suck up X amount of copper, but if you have excess amount of it around, it won't suck it all up. So some will still get through. And and that in that regard, there's really no optimal ratio of zinc to copper. Um, no, it's no. just getting some extra copper to make sure that you don't yeah, become. Yeah. So I know um, in some uh, formulations, so copper you may need. So the zinc level that we need is just about like around 10 milligrams. Our copper needs are less than a milligram. Mm. Um, so uh, you, you don't need to have 11 milligrams of copper. You'd probably only need like one to two milligrams of copper uh, to overcome that, that, to have enough to still get through if you have that excess. So even eating some foods that are, you know, provide extra copper it would be or being aware of the copper that you're taking yes. wise, yes. you don't necessarily have to take another supplement on top of that. Right. Um, and we're almost at, a, or actually we are over time, unfortunately. So uh, I, I wanted to mention though, before I, I finish up, um, that there have been a lot of questions about zinc and, and COVID, um, zinc and long COVID. And I will mention that, you know, a lot of studies have not been done. There haven't been a lot of clinical trials on zinc and COVID. Uh, we, we, we still follow those with interest. Um, Dr. Ho touched on some of these in her Think Zinc uh, webinar that we will, of course, send to everybody if they want some more information. Uh, but uh, Emily, do you want to finish up with maybe a, 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 a comment about zinc and, and say, I mean, it's cold and flu season right now. You know, um, should we think about possibly getting some more zinc during this uh this time of the year? Um, yeah, I mean, I always uh, advocate for making sure that you are getting enough zinc. Um, and a lot of people aren't getting enough zinc in their, their regular diet. So taking, again, a multivitamin, multimineral with zinc or a, a zinc supplement, but again, trying to make sure you don't get to, too too much uh, per uh, per day is, 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 is going to be important. But um, definitely to think about zinc, especially in the cold and flu season, is, is something to to, to consider, um, including maybe taking a supplement just as extra insurance given uh, the uh, getting enough in your diet may be sometimes problematic. So, you know, nutritional support, as we, we've said several times, but not necessarily hammering that zinc in there uh, to necessarily cause other problems uh, that, that could erupt. Yeah, uh, I know <laughs> a lot of the supplementation trials that have been ongoing for COVID, for flu, for cold, you know, show some promise. But again, a lot of times we don't know if that supplement is, is restoring a deficiency um, or if it's actually supplemental uh, above and beyond. And so far, the evidence is 
preventing a deficiency definitely has effects. Um, getting super amounts of, of zinc may do more harm. So I think I'm going to have to close up there. I know there's some great questions still in the Q&A, and we're going to have to, uh, I think, take this into our um, newsletter uh, for, for follow-up. So, um, I mean, obviously, if you have a question that didn't get addressed and you, you want to see it addressed, you can still email, it, email us, lpi at oregonstate.edu, and we'll get Emily's answers together and get into our next edition of the newsletter, which will be coming out in this uh, later, the, the winter slash spring uh, edition. So um, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and the great questions. Uh, this is one of the reasons we do things like this, to help you find the answers uh, to to nutrition, nutrition questions and questions about vitamins, minerals, and other parts of our diet. Um, and I'd like to give Emily one more chance to 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 address everybody and and uh, just bring us to a close. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I literally could talk about zinc like for days and days and days. Um, so if you have more questions, feel free to reach on to uh, reach out to us. Uh, we're also working on our schedule for 2023. Um, mark on your calendars, Linus Pauling Day. It will be coming in February and we'll likely have a, a webinar focused on vitamin C uh, again as well. So um, take a note of that um, and uh, we'll have some communication at the start of the year. Um, Alex mentioned our newsletter is also almost out the door as well so be on the lookout for that um, again if you like uh, events like this and what we do at the institute uh, Alex will pop up the link uh, for and the QR code for uh, giving to the institute as well we really uh, value the support of our, our of all of our followers to help us uh, support the research and support events like this um, lastly again if you have any comments or questions um, again email us at lpi at oregonstate.edu um, we will be, we'll do our best to, uh, to answer all your questions. Um, and then lastly, be sure to visit our website um, and our social media page. Stay healthy um, and stay well.